welcome to this week's History Now. Today I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Patrick Spate to the studio, who's going to be talking to us about his research and book on the Irish Argentines. Patrick, thanks very much for coming in to talk about your book. It's on uh, the Irish in Argentina in part. Perhaps people are more familiar with, you know, the Irish diaspora. We automatically think of North America or Australia or things like that there, but there has been a significant um, population of people of Irish extraction in Argentina for quite some time. That's correct, Barry, and it's probably a good point of departure because one of the interesting aspects of the Irish community in Argentina or the Irish diaspora in Argentina is that they confronted a completely different social reality because the Irish who went to the English destinations like New York or Britain, New Zealand or Australia, confronted that historic antagonism. That antagonism is between Catholicism and Protestantism, the, the, the conflict between uh, Ireland and Britain. That was apparent to them when they went to the United States, when they went to England, they were discriminated against. No Irish need apply, etc. But in Argentina, you had a Catholic population, a Catholic diaspora, moving into a Catholic nation, a Catholic nation which had a, a constitution which uh, basically determined that the president must be a Catholic and that one of his duties must be the defense of the Catholic Church. So you would expect, for example, that the Irish who went to Argentina then would have an opportunity having freed themselves from this, this historical antagonism between uh, Catholicism and Protestantism, because there weren't many Protestants in Argentina. There was an English colony because Argentina was seen as part of the informal empire, the British empire. So you did have an English colony there of business people. And uh, when the Irish went there, there was no conflict whatsoever, no conflict whatsoever between the English and the Irish. Uh, because the Irish became the workers for the British companies that established themselves there. There are debates about when the Irish first landed in Argentina. Some I have looked at some things which says, you know, the 16th century. There's a very famous Father Field, who I know, I know you're, you're familiar with. So given that there is such a long-standing Irish you know, not so much as a community, but Irish involvement in Argentina from that time to the time that uh, your research covers. Did this Irish community evolve over that time or was it just, you know? The Irish community did evolve. Um, your right father Field was perhaps the first Irish man to step foot on um, Argentine soil. And it's reputed that he's the first person to celebrate mass in Argentina. Uh, but uh, the Irish arrived um, in fits and starts, really because they were part of the, um, the, the flight of the wild geese, their descendants. They, they arrived in Spain. Uh, they became part of the Spanish um, governance and, and part of the, uh, of, of, of the Spanish civil service. And so when the Spanish began to uh, to develop their interest in Argentina, the Irish came out with them. Mm -hmm. So a small community of Irish people were there. Okay, and there's, of course, 19th century is a big, sort of a, a very important period for the Irish going to Argentina. We're more familiar with, you know, the, this vision of the Irish person fleeing famine, you know, in the mid 19th century. but. The people who went to Argentina in the 19th century weren't necessarily those people escaping famine? No, they weren't. I mean, many of them were entrepreneurs, business people who set out to make money. And uh, Peter Sheridan was one of the first to start uh, the sheep uh, rearing industry and the saladeros, that's the, the meat salting industry there. And in a way, they were looking for labor and they decided that, that the best labor was their own family and friends back in Ireland and the connections were made and families and individuals came out and uh, took up positions in, in sheep farming. Okay, and these people who were very much involved in the sheep farming and the industries att uh, attached to that, where did they come from in Ireland? They mainly came from the Midlands okay. and some came from Wexford. Yeah. But the majority of the Irish came out 
after the famine. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they were impacted adversely by the famine. Yeah. Because to go to Argentina required money. And so they became part of what was referred to as a chain migration. They went there as an opportunity rather than f being people who were fleeing oppression. And uh, some of the Irish that I met uh, when I was doing my research, and these would have been people in their 80s and 90s, were pains to say that they were not affected, their families were not affected by the famine. They wanted to distance themselves from the famine. And one particular man, a father, Francisco Murray, he made it very clear, no, we came out as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. We were not fleeing Ireland, mm -hmm. you know, when he was referring to his family roots. Mm -hmm. But the Irish did go out, and the key figure uh, who helped mobilize the Irish and uh, provided them with a kind of uh, their, their endogenous kind of uh, platform, as it were. I mean, because they, they became a community that simply lived amongst themselves, intermarried amongst themselves. That's why they were described as endogenous, was Father Fahey. Mm -hmm. And he came from, from Galway. Now, Father Fahey is a man who is idolized in the Irish Argentine community, almost, almost uh, they, they see him almost as a secular saint. But they don't take into consideration some of the other aspects of, of his life in Argentina. And one refers to, one episode refers to Camilo O'Gorman. I'm not sure if you've heard of Camilo O'Gorman. Camilo O'Gorman uh, was born into uh, a well-established Irish Argentine family. Uh, she was 18 years old and fell in love with a Jesuit priest. They eloped. They moved to the north of Argentina. The very fact that they eloped caused consternation and shame within the Irish Argentine community. They felt that their community had been held up to ridicule. And so they moved north and their idea was to go to Bolivia but they needed to earn money to get there. So in the North, they established themselves as teachers in a little village. And they did so well, and uh, they helped so many people, and uh, the school was so successful that the mayor constantly wanted to do something, to say, look, we want to give something back, so we'd like to organize a party for you or something. And they kept on saying, no, 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 we don't want that. But on one occasion, they just capitulated. They gave in and said, OK, we'll, we'll go and have a, and join you and have this party. And so they were getting all these accolades and stuff. And then in walked a priest called Father Gannon, who priests then, Irish priests then, were peripatetic. They moved around to provide ministry to the small Irish communities and stuff. And he spotted them. And he betrayed them. Okay. And he made it, when, when General Rosas and Father Fahey discovered that they'd been found, they decided that an exemplary uh, measure had to be taken. Basically, they should be executed. They were brought back to um, a place called Santos Lugares, which is uh, a small distance from Buenos Aires. And they discovered that uh, Camila was pregnant, eight months pregnant. And um, under the constitution, a woman who was pregnant could not be executed. So Rosas asked a Irish Argentine lawyer, Sarsfield, um, to come up with some kind of legal ruse that would allow them, theological legal ruse that would allow them to execute this woman. And before they executed her and her lover, her partner, they gave her a, a, a glass of holy water so that her unborn child would be baptized and therefore would go to heaven. So that was an interesting story for me in how Irish Argentines, in a sense, related to the state. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't stand yeah. up for this woman. Yeah. They, they felt that their identity, their uh, personal integrity, their sense of who they were as Catholic Irish had been compromised by this woman's extraordinary sin. In terms of your research, you spent some time in Argentina. Could you tell us how long you spent there and what way you approached your research when you were out there? Well, I uh, spent nine months there. And the focus of my research was to explore how Irish Argentines responded to the rise and fall of Perón, mm -hmm. who became president between 1946 and 1955. He was overthrown in a coup d'etat in 1955. 
And then he returned to Argentina in 1973 and then died on the 1st of July 1974. So my purpose of my research was to find out how they responded to his redistributive policies when he became president in 1946. And then to find out how they responded to the dirty war, mm -hmm. which uh, took place between 1976 and 19. 83. It ended after the Falklands War. Um, and that is a story in itself because obviously you have to make contact with people in Argentina. You want to uh, find people who will be the gatekeepers to the Irish Argentine community, who would facilitate your entry into their homes to do interviews. And uh, the first kind of big surprise was when I phoned up uh, several people from my office at Queen's University. And I remember speaking to one Irish priest who got very concerned. He said, look, I don't mind introducing you to my Irish Argentine parishioners, but I'm a bit nervous that you're going to talk to them about the dirty war. Irish Argentines don't like talking about the dirty war. And furthermore, they don't like talking about a man called Rodolfo Walsh a writer and investigative journalist who was uh, murdered and disappeared by the Argentine state in 1976. So you, a big part of this was your conducting interviews, as you've said. Now, out of all the information, there's a very interesting sort of quirk, if, if you will, about Irish Argentines that I've heard uh, from a number of sources that to speak English with an Irish accent? That's right. Um, it surprised me as well. Uh, I, the first person I met, I think, when I arrived in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, was a writer called Juan José Delaney. Juan José Delaney. He's a, a novelist, uh, an academic, and he explores the aspect of uh, porteño. That's the way in which um, the Irish used English and Spanish and he explores that in all different, uh, in all its dimensions. He also had an interest in, 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 in Rodolfo Walsh. But when he sat down and he met me in a cafe, I found it hard to believe that he was Argentine because he spoke in an accent that could be traced right back to Westmeath where his family had originated in the 1860s and 1870s. Okay. And this particular work, as you called it, this particular characteristic, was something that was common to the Irish Argentine community who were of a certain age. Mm -hmm. So the older they were, the more pronounced their Irish accent was. And they reveled in that. I remember one particular character telling me how he arrived in um, Dublin Airport and he, he was being questioned by, by passport control and they couldn't believe he was Argentine. They said, no, you're Irish, aren't you? And he said, no, no, I'm Argentine. And then another interesting little story about that was a, 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 a priest called Father Bob Kilmeat. Now, he wasn't a priest then, he was a, he was a seminarian, and um, he happened to be uh, travelling to London, and this was in 1976. And when he arrived, his English was so perfect, and he spoke with such a pronounced southern accent that they arrested him because they thought he was, <laughs> he was an undercover IRA man, uh, you know, getting into the country on an Argentine passport. And he said, no, I'm Argentine, I'm not Irish. And uh, they held him in, in captivity for 24 hours before one of the Palatine priests in London came up to the airport and ser to search for him and then discovered that, that uh, he had been held because they were going to send him back to Argentina. Yeah, that's a, a, an amazing um, quirk, as I say. Now, part of your research is very much focused on the newspaper of the Irish Argentines in, based in Buenos Aires as the Southern Cross newspaper. Can you tell me how that informs your, your research? Well, the, the, the Southern Cross was central to my research because I wanted to look at how Irish Argentines responded to different facets of the ups and downs of politics from 1875 right up to uh, the, the Dirty War. Now, as you know, when you're doing a PhD, you have to do a, a historical backdrop. And my historical backdrop was looking at 
Argent the, uh, the Argentine community uh, and how it responded to the First World War, how it responded to the Second World War, how it responded to the rise of fascism, how it responded to the rise of Hitler. All of that was, was, was part of my remit in order to build up a sense of how the, the, the Southern Cross operated within the Irish Argentine community. And what I found was <laughs> was disappointing at one level, but it was the reality mm. that uh, a lot of the um, editorials and the correspondence to the newspapers were and in, in, at times xenophobic. They were uh, anti-English. They were uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, they uh, they they tended to be uh, a, a, they tended to see themselves as a, as a people apart as yeah. it were. And uh, just just to clarify for, for our viewers, this, the Southern Cross newspaper was uh, founded by an Irishman. The Southern Cross newspaper was founded by F Father Patrick Dillon in 1875. But it's important to point out that there was another newspaper called the Standard that was founded by two, two other Irish, Irish yeah. men. Brothers? Two brothers mm -hmm. uh, from the Mulhall brothers from Dublin. And their newspaper was founded in 1861 and became an international newspaper. It had, it had stature, it had uh, international cachet, but it was, they were seen as uh, pro-British and supporting the British Empire. And so they got a lot of buy-in from the very wealthy Irish Argentines, those who were millionaires who made money on, on sheep and, 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 um, and beef and other forms of, of, of agricultural farming, and they ploughed money into the Mulhall's uh, newspaper, The Standard. Uh, Father Dillon uh, also wrote for The Standard, and uh, he was a very clever man. He became a priest, a priest very young. Uh, he was also a theologian. And when he arrived in Argentina, the Catholic hierarchy uh, kind of spotted that he was somebody they could work with. And during the first Vatican Council, he was one of the perito, one of the experts that the Argentine Catholic hi hierarchy brought with them to Rome. And while he was in Rome, he would write back reports to the standard. Uh, why did he set up the Southern Cross. I've, there's, there's no archival information. There's okay. nothing that says I'm set, setting up the Irish, uh, the Southern Cross for this particular reason. But I have a feeling that having come back from the First Vatican Council and having realized that the Catholic Church was utterly opposed to any form of secularization and all the, the philosophies that were becoming, coming out of the Enlightenment and were beginning to affect and influence politics. And the very fact that uh, Argentina eventually uh, banned the teaching of the Catholic religion in schools in 1884, that he saw that coming and he felt that the Irish community that was coming out were not warming to that because the Irish community really, even though they were Catholic, and even though Argentina was a Catholic country, they wanted their own priests. Okay. They wanted their own priests. And they felt that their Catholicism was quite distinct from Argentine Catholicism. And I think in a way he wanted to, um, to secure that kind of, of community, that they would have a newspaper that gave them information about Ireland, but also information about the Catholic faith. We've established here that the, the, the Southern Cross had this particular idea of Irish identity. There are plenty of people in Irish Argentine history who didn't fit into that sense of identity, and I know you've dedicated part of your research to that. Probably the most well-known would probably be Che Guevara, but there's a lot of people in there who didn't feature in the, the Southern Cross. Can you tell us a bit about those people? The historical marker for the conflict that, um, that emerged uh, in the 19, late 1960s and 70s in Argentina with the Irish Argentine community was the impact of the Second Vatican Council and the rise of liberation theology in Latin America. Because one of the confusing aspects of, of Peronism is that on the, on the one hand, he was seen as almost a proto-fascist uh, leader, but on the other, he had introduced uh, social changes that benefited the workers. And when he was exiled 
uh, the, 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 those, uh, that, that, that belief that somehow or other Argentina could reform itself and uh, there could be a redistribution of wealth and all the rest remained. And so when uh, the uh, big conference of Latin American bishops took place in Medellin in Colombia 1968 and the whole concept of liberation theology was developed, this impacted on a lot of Argentines, including Irish Argentines, who uh, decided that the church and working with the poor was one way in which they could transform society. Unfortunately, the state didn't see it that way, and nor did the hierarchical church in Argentina. They were opposed to anything to do with liberation theology. Um, so you had a, a church in, I mentioned the Holy Cross Church, uh, which was uh, kind of the cradle of the, uh, the spiritual aspect of the Irish Argentine community, run by the Passionists. They began to uh, develop a theology of the poor. They began to go out and provide pastoral help to the poor. When you had the, uh, when Pinochet was overthrown in Chile, they opened their doors to the exiles that were coming through on their way to Europe. The Irish Argentines, the traditional Irish Argentines, did not like that. And in fact, the first indication that the traditional Irish Argentines did not like what was going on was when back in 1968, in October, uh, Ber Father Bernardo Hughes, at his Sunday Mass after Che Guevara was assassinated in Bolivia, he said, I would like to, uh, us all to play, pray for the repose of the soul of Dr. Guevara. And half the church walked out. So you got a sense then that the community was not, the Irish Argent community was not going to support this radical approach that was coming from the uh, liberation theologians because they associated it with communism, with what was happening in Cuba. And they were people who had, as, as uh, a former uh, presidential candidate told me, um, Ricardo Lopez Murphy, that they had seen themselves as Irish people who worked hard who had pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, who had made money, and they were not going to give that money away in social welfare handouts to people who didn't work. So uh, to kind of segue into one of the most traumatic events in recent Irish Argentine history, and that is the murder of uh, priests and seminarians at the Palatine Church, uh, St. Patrick's, in a, a very well healed uh, neighborhood of Belgrano that happened in uh, the 4th of July 1976. You had several priests there, Father Alfie Kelly, Father Alfie Layden, and then a, f a priest of French extraction, Father Defoe. You had a number of seminarians, two of them Irish Argentine, Jorge Kelly and Bob Kilmeade. And they had imbibed this new approach to theology and they wanted to work with the poor. The problem was that they were in a church that was right in the middle of a very wealthy district, which also included members of the armed forces. And when the dirty war started and the army began to raid people's houses, including picking up Irish Argentines like, uh, like um, uh, uh, Lucia Cullen, for example, murdered and disappeared, Father Kelly spoke out because he discovered, uh, he discovered that, that when the army arrested people, they would go in and steal all their property and then sell it off in auctions. And when he discovered that some of his parishioners were taking advantage of that and buying these stole, this sequestrated property in, 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 in auctions, he spoke out about it in, uh, in one of his sermons. And then he was, he was uh, treated as a, a pariah. He was considered a communist. And then a petition began to, to go around the community asking people to sign it so that he could be removed from the community. The very fact that the seminarians were out working with the community rather than uh, play, playing the traditional role of being seminarians and saying prayers all the time uh, also upset the local community because they thought there's something going on here. These people are too radical. And then on the 4th of July, uh, 1976, uh, 
represented or, or, or uh, the Navy forces or the, the kind of the death squad attached to the Navy forces arrived at the parochial house and murdered the three priests and the two seminarians. And what actually happened was that the Irish Argentines didn't want to admit that this was something that they should explore and find out what happened. What they wanted to believe was that Father Kelly was a leftist, that he was a, a, a radical, and that he brought it on himself and on the other priests who were murdered, that it was his fault, rather than basically the, the state deciding that it wanted to take out anybody that was opposed or in favour of socialism or in favour of the redistribution of wealth. They wanted to take them out. Okay, and, and in, in terms of the Irish community as it is now, do you think that they're in a transition you know, in terms of maybe integrating that much more than perhaps I have done in, in previous generations? Well, the, I mean, the Irish government talks about 500,000. The majority of those people are Argentines. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, when I started my research, the, 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 the concept Irish Argentine was in vogue, but now it's Argentine Irish because they can no longer sustain the notion. Most people are Argentine and they have an Irish background. But the remnant that I talked about, the older people who were very, very conservative, they're still there. And perhaps they will pass on those conservative values to a younger generation, who knows. But there is a section of the Argentine community that did not accept what was happening and did write letters in support of Father Fred Richards and did stand up to uh, the vitriol that he received from other Argentines, uh, Irish Argentines, who were opposed to what he was doing. And uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, role of um, the writer uh, Rodolfo Walsh. Mm -hmm. Now, when I set out on my journey to explore the Irish in Argentina, I was told, don't raise the question of Rodolfo Walsh. The, Rodolfo Walsh came from an Irish Argentine family. Uh, when, his fa when his father fell upon hard times, the family was split up. And he attended what was a school for the poor Irish called the Fahe, the Fahe school after Father Fahe. And when he became a writer, he wrote stories which incensed the Irish Argentine community because he talked about the brutality that he experienced in that school. And they felt that they were being let down. But they also felt they were let down because he was a member of the Montaneros. Now, he didn't start off life as a lefty. He started off life in the 1940s to the right. He um, was opposed to Peron. He supported the overthrow of Peron in 1955. But he wrote this extraordinary book called Operation Massacre. And he wrote it because he was incensed to discover that the uh, military junta that had overthrown um, Peron had killed, murdered 12 or 15 men. And uh, they claimed that, that they, these, they, they claimed that they hadn't, that these people were executed under, under legal, uh, you know, uh, under, under illegal guise. And he investigated that and discovered that they weren't. And uh, he was persecuted for that book. Uh, he, he, and uh, once, he, um, once he wrote that book and he realized it kind of was an epiphany for him. And then uh, the Cuban Revolution happened and he went to Cuba and um, he, um, developed a much more kind of fine uh, uh, tuned analysis of how uh, capital and labor worked and, and how uh, people were exploited and all the rest. And he, and he came back to Argentina and eventually became part of the Montaneros. Yeah. So Patrick, it's a, it's a fascinating study of a lesser known element of the Irish diaspora. Can you tell us the title of the book and where people can get it? have a copy here. The Irish Argentine Identity in an Age of Political Challenge and Change, 1875 to 1983. And as I say, available in all good bookshops. It's published by Peter Lang. Patrick, thank you very much for coming in and taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>